It's an honor for Alan to be here. It's an honor for, for me to say it's an honor for you to be here. And thank you, Alan, for everything that you do in this county. It's much thank appreciated. You. Thank you, Stu. Thank you very much. And before I get started, there are a lot of folks also from county government who are here that can also assist if we uh, have any questions. Uh, Chief John Butler, is he here? I don't know if he's come yet. I know he's on his way. Uh, John Bird is here from our Recreation and Parks Department. Uh, we also have my Chief of Staff, Diane Wilson, as well as Lonnie Robbins, our Chief Administrative Officer. We also have uh, Jackie Scott, our Director of Community Resources and Services, is here. Uh, we have County Councilperson Jen Tarasa. Thank you for being here, Jen. Uh, representing Councilman Weinstein is Jesse Keller. Are you okay, Jesse? Can I introduce you now? We joked earlier to make sure she was ready. And also Julia Singleton here for Councilwoman Sigety. Liz Bobo is here, former County Council member, former County Executive, and former Delegate. Where are you, Liz? You're somewhere. I thought I saw you. I don't know where you walked out. Okay. Uh, let me see what else I got here. I think I've hit everyone. The other folks were already introduced earlier on Val and everybody else. And also James Zoller is here, who's our agriculture uh, coordinator. Speaking of agriculture, I know there's some folks here who want to talk about the uh, CB21, and so I thought I would uh, give a little update on where things are. Um, I've had discussions with uh, Councilperson Sigety and Councilperson Fox, um, and it's my understanding, maybe uh, Councilperson Traza can correct me wrong, it's my understanding that the bill will be tabled and it will not be voted on next Monday. Uh, that's why I didn't file any amendments today, because I had that, I was advised that. Um, but also I want to let you know that um, I've been talking to Ted Mariani and Rick Lober and some other folks to try to figure out the best way we could go about this. And you know, I, I put some amendments out as possible amendments to be filed. Um, and I did that as a way of trying to bring consensus again. You know, we started this a long time ago, even before the last election with the task force. And that met for a long time, and there was a lot of controversy about the results of that task force and what the report was. And we had two minority report and a majority report. So then we put together a small work group trying to, and Mr. Mariani was part of that, as Mr. Lober and Zach Brendel and Brent Rudley, trying to figure out another way we can get a consensus. And I thought we'd probably, I thought we had worked one out. That's what I frankly thought. And again, that did not come to a consensus. So uh, uh, we continue to have this issue. Uh, I put these amendments in most recently after speaking with Mr. Mariani and, and going back and forth with Rick Lober some more, and I really thought these would help us to get a little closer. And I appreciate John Tagaris's uh, words, at least in the paper, talking about at least they were moving in the right direction. Weren't far enough, but at least they were moving in the right direction. Uh, but still, I can tell that that's not where we're supposed to be. And so, just so you'll know, uh, I have actually uh, uh, requested uh, and, and asked uh, Councilperson Sigety and Councilperson Fox to seriously consider withdrawing the legislation. I think that this is not the time for us to go forward with this for a couple reasons. Uh, one, uh, we're doing a code rewrite for our zoning. Val's talked about that, Stu's talked about that. Uh, I think that what would happen here, we'd go forward on this, we'd vote on this, and we'd have to revisit it again next year at this time where we're doing the zoning code rewrite. Seems to me we should do that and we're doing everything else comprehensively. Secondly, as some of you may know, the state is studying yard waste, food residuals, and organic materials uh, right now. They started that study in January of 2018. It's not expected to be finished until January of 2019. I know Jeff Danis from our uh, Department of Public Works is part of that. I believe Zach Brendel is too. There might be some other folks from Howard County. Uh, and I was looking through some of the minutes today, uh, getting ready for tonight, and Mr. Danis had an interesting point. In one of the meetings, it says, Mr. Dan has brought up the fact that the Maryland Department of Agriculture, the Maryland Department of the Environment, and the State Highway Administration all have inconsistent regulations dealing with composting. Seems to me we've got to make sure the state is consistent and knows what's going on before we try to design our regulations. Because for us to design regulations ourselves or code and then find out the state has done something different seems to make no sense to me. And so that's why I have requested that the, uh, the sponsors do that. Uh, we'll see if they, uh, if they take my request, if they uh, decide to do that or not, but I wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, and I will, if the bill, if they say no to that and they decide to go forward, then we'll still pursue some amendments. Uh, but if it isn't to where I feel is best for the community, I'll veto it. So I just want you guys to know that right now that that's kind of where we are. Um, so. Um, and, and I will tell you from the beginning, uh, my goal always has been the health and safety 
Uh, industrial mulching on ag press has never been my desire, and, and I know some people think that's not true, but that is true, and nothing I've done ever has been trying to get that to happen. Uh, I live on an ag preservation property. I certainly don't want that for my property. Uh, but I also want to make sure that there are farmers that can continue to survive. And I think we have to figure out some way we can do that without having the issues uh, that the community members have brought up that are valid issues. And so I think we need to work stronger, we need to work better, and I think we need to get some guidance from the state what their regulations are going to be before we decide what ours are going to be. Because it just doesn't make sense for us to do this and have all of a sudden they do something totally different and then we're stuck and go back again. So that's where I am on that. So I want to say that ahead of time so if there's any discussions we can, we can have that. Um, with that, that's a lot longer than I usually go, I know. For those of you who have been to my town halls, you know, I don't talk very long, very much at the beginning. So let's just uh, open it up. And like I said, we have other folks here. I do want to thank Steve Snowgrove. Uh, he, he mentioned Laura about the budget. And he has been a one patient person. Uh, he and I talked many times about the budget. And I will be totally honest with you, and he knows this, I was not really open at the beginning to having the county help with the operating expenses of the Howard County General Hospital. I wasn't sure that was the right way to go. But hopefully, as most elected officials should be, I kept an open mind. I kept on listening to him. Of course, I saw Sue Cohen in my mind every day, too, walking around. Um, I'd go to sleep at night and I'd work. No. Um, no, I still see, I, I see Stu from my Maple Lawn days still. But, um, but Steve has been very generous and very gracious with his time and very patient with me to help explain to me why we really need to start figuring out how we can help. Uh, the, the Howard County General Hospital's mission and their requirements are basically what nonprofits do for Howard County. You know, when we have a nonprofit like Grassroots or a nonprofit like Hope Works who are doing things that county government can't do, we need to help them because if they weren't there, we'd be doing that. Uh, Howard County General Hospital has been put in a very difficult position. If you're not familiar, they, uh, they are in a position where they're basically responsible for the health of Howard County. Now, that's not really fair, folks. They can maybe be responsible for the people who come into the hospital and try to help the people who maybe leave the hospital, but to tell them that they're in charge or responsible for the health of Howard County really isn't fair, especially when they can't just charge whatever they want to charge. They're told how much they can charge. They can't just increase their rates. And so I think it was something where Howard County needs to sit down and say, you know what, how can we be a partner? How can we help you make sure that our population health gets stronger? And so we're starting it this year. It may not sound like a lot, but $389,000, but it is a big deal because I believe we're one of the first, maybe not the first, one of the first local jurisdictions to do that. Uh, but our population health, the health of our seniors, those with mental illness and behavioral health needs and others need to have some help. And we need to be part of that as a team. So thank you for your leadership, Steve. Thanks. Um, with that being said, what we would ask folks to do is please come forward. Uh, don't ask questions from where you're sitting because this is being videotaped. Because uh, we like to have our, uh, our town halls be able to get out to the public. And we put them on the website so people can watch them. Uh, and, then, um, and then that way, if you come to the microphone, we can make sure you're heard. Uh, I also want to thank our, uh, our sign language interpreters who are always here all the time. Thank you very much. It's very important that you're here, so thank you. Ms. Jaffrey. Good evening, County Executive. Good evening. <clears throat> if you're putting people above politics, how come you didn't consult with the wider community before putting beat cops in schools? Okay, fine. I, um, that is something that the police chief and the school system talked about. And so I, uh, our police chief runs our police department. And he talked to the school system. They said they liked the idea. And frankly, it's not something that's brand new, as you probably have heard. Our police department has gone and done that in the past. And I have visited a lot of schools since then. And I can tell you, not one complaint from one administrator or one teacher or anyone else. I haven't got any complaints. They think it's a great idea that our, uh, our police officers are part of that community. And I think it helps us with community outreach along with security. I don't think there's anything wrong with our young people seeing a police officer. I think it's important that our young people see police officers. And they need to see them when they're not in trouble or when there's something bad happening to their family or something bad happening to their community. They should see police officers when it's a good time and they can get an opportunity to understand who they are and better understand uh, what they do. And I can tell you a, a quick story. Uh, there is a, um, one of the elementary schools, I was with a principal walking through school one day and she said, the reason why we need a police officer to come here is because, look, Mr. Kittleman, that door over there, that goes to our roof. I didn't know that. And if I'm a police officer walking in for the first time, I might not know that. 
But if there's somebody who's in the school hurting somebody, you want to know where all the doors go to, and you want to know all the nooks and crannies so you can make sure you can better protect our citizens. So to me, it makes a lot of sense. So anyway, thank you. Yes, yeah, Russ. As you know, there have been a lot of complaints in the last few years about noise from Meriwether. Um, the police have told us that they only record the first two or three each night, although there have been a lot more. Um, Meriwether hired a consultant company to come in and give them recommendations when they were planning the, ra the raising of the roof and other additions. One of the planning board's requirements when they gave their approval was that they, Meriwether follow the recommendations. There were two recommendations. One was that they not raise the speakers okay. and that they point them down. Uh, I just went by Meriwether yesterday and well, actually one of the planning boards even commented, you may have to put some struts down to hold the speakers from the new raised roof. Well, I went by Meriwether yesterday and the new speakers are mounted right at the bottom of the raised roof. Mm -hmm. So is there anybody in the county who would verify that Meriwether actually did adhere to the planning board approval restrictions? We can certainly look at that. This is the first news. I haven't been to Meriwether since the roof has been completed. Um, and so I, could check, I will check on it. Val, I don't know if you can put that down. We can have someone check on it. Also, I should note that we do have other staff around. A lot of folks from our constituent service here, so they'll write down the questions that I can't answer, which that's one of them because I, I don't know. But we can check into it and get back to you, Russ. Thank you. But thanks for sharing it. Thanks. Hey, Lisa. Hello. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I have two questions. Sure. The second one is short and sweet, or maybe not so sweet. I'll, I'll go with the first one. Um, I have been out campaigning in District 4 quite often. And one of the important issues I'm hearing about um, in the Hickory Ridge area is the redevelopment of the Village Center. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering, is there another version of it or something else that we can do that can you know, make that redevelopment a little more compatible for the people and make everyone sort of come into agreement with a, with a version of it? And then my second question is, okay. what in the world's going on with the turtles? I'm hearing that there's some turtle napping going on. <laughs> around Howard County That's news and to me. CA uh, is aware of it and apparently mm -hmm. they've contacted the police and there's a person going around scooping up turtles and bagging them and taking them away. I had not heard that but I can certainly check with the police department and find out. Uh, on your other topic, I don't know if Val, if you want to talk a little about the Hickory Ridge situation, I know that um, uh, it's not going to be in front of the zoning board because there is a lot of contention there and I understand that issue, but I don't know. The other point you're making is probably more of between the developer and the village board, but I don't know. Yeah, don't know anything about the well, why don't you come here too? Why don't you go to Mike? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank Thanks. you. Um, Hickory Ridge right now has gone through the, uh, the planning board at this point. It's been to the DAP two times. I went to the planning board. Uh, the planning board recommended it to the zoning board. Uh, it was, uh, I think the idea was for it to go to the planning board still under this council, uh, you know, but uh, they chose not to uh, schedule it. Um, and so it's going to be left up to the, when, once the new council comes in um, as the zoning board, they'll be, they'll be making a decision on that. Okay, but but it's, and it's a private company dealing with that, so it's, you know, they have to make that decision. Thank you, okay, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Allen, how are you? Hi, Allen. Here come the savages. Yes, good. <laughs> I know it's usually great to be named number one, but uh, how do you feel about Howard County being identified by Maryland DNR as number one in forest clearing, and how will you acquire and preserve forested open space in the future? I appreciate that, and I certainly don't want to be not number one on that list ever. <laughs> um, and this also brings up something that I know I think Ms. Garber has talked about with Val Lasdens and maybe Diane Wilson in my office. Uh, I think this is something we should be looking at in our zoning code rewrite as well. We should be looking at ways in which we can preserve uh, open space and environmentally sensitive areas, not just in the west but also in the east. And I know that's a discussion that's come up and I think we should include that as we're doing the zoning rewrite and that could be something we can address at the time. time. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Did you want to go to it? Because I know you're, you're, you're a twosome, I know. So. <laughs> yeah. That's okay, John. We're a one-some. We're a one-some. Okay. And uh, it's been a while since I've talked directly with you, Alan, Good over the past uh, couple of years. Yeah. Uh, want to thank you, too, for what you've tried to do for the county um, wide um, in the past four years. Mm -hmm. But as you know, Tiff O'Neill said, all politics is local. Yes. And, um, you know, as Ellen um, stated, um, our county is last in the state when it comes to preserving uh, natural areas, um, forested areas. 
And um, as you know, we've had our ongoing local battle in Savage regarding the development, mm -hmm. the Savage uh, settle, settlement. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I've caught the wind over the past couple of years that you and your administration have been eager to push this project along and clearing the five acreage um, area, including swapping parkland, um, which we are last in, in the county, um, for the benefit of the developers. And I think we would like to have an explanation as to why, uh, in view of all the developmental issues, development issues in the county, um, your administration seems to be wanting to push this project along very rapidly when we've been trying to put it on haul, on pause, mm -hmm. to protect the river and the trail park and the animals and us. We're animals too, but we re and we really <laughs> love the area. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Um, I guess my first response would be, if we're pushing it so quick, it's been two years, it doesn't sound like we're pushing it that quickly. Um, and certainly the, the swap has not gone from the council, and that's within our purview to put that there, and we haven't done that yet. How's it going to get there? It had to be. We'd have to. We had to put it there. We haven't put it there yet. And uh, the, that the, coming from your the legislation, yes. And we haven't. We just haven't decided to go before the council with that yet. So we're not pushing it that fast. If we were, that would be from the council previously. So, so where does the debate stand now? Let me decide. Let's get there. Um, I think the issue we have there, of course, is. I think what's important for people to know is that you know when the zoning was changed for that property, now it's residential. Uh, there was already a plan to build 35 units there before even the swap was swap was considered, as you know. Well, we and know so, that. And so there's a plan to build 35 homes, which actually the community, I think there's a signed agreement saying they agreed to the 35 homes. And so then the swap was presented to us by the community, not by the developer, by the community to consider the swap because they thought it'd be better to move it above, higher up, off the way from the river. So it wasn't an idea that a developer came up with the swap. It was the community that came to the developer with the swap. And so then we started looking at doing that. And so. Uh, I think it's important that people realize that if the swap doesn't happen, that doesn't mean there won't be anything there. They already had another plan they could go forward with without the swap, and that was certainly in, in line with what the zoning allows. And so I don't think you could say our administration's pushing it. We're not, like, forcing it down. They have a right to build on that property, and they have a right to build on it based upon the zoning changes that were made in 2013. Yeah, they have a right to build on yeah. it, but without the swap, they're going to have more difficulties. I, I don't know if they were or not. They were ready to go forward with it before without the swap. And it's like I say, the swap wasn't their idea. It was the community's idea. Well, yeah, yeah um, and, and we felt we were put in a difficult position and, and at the initially looked at as a possibility. Okay, I'm just, um, I think it's important to do that, though. Okay, yes. but thank you very much, Ron. I yeah. appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Mr. Digger, it's good to see you. Thank you. County Executive Kilman, thank you for your comments tonight. Um, I want to say a couple of things, and I'll ask the question. Sure. I think, uh, firstly, when you think you're doing the right thing for the right reasons, you have to fight. There's no limit to stopping, mm -hmm. and I think okay. we believe that's what's going on, and that's why, as exhausting as this has been, we have mm -hmm. to continue, and until the bill, I respect that. Until the bill is, you know, is gone, then I think we'll, you know, we'll continue to fight, and I think we're going to ask some questions tonight related to that until mm -hmm. such time. That's the first thing. I respect that. Thank you. Second thing is, uh, in terms of, you know, again, I think, you know, Rutley, you mentioned him, is a great example of someone that needs to do mulch. We, mm -hmm. We've been very supportive of mm -hmm. the farmers on mm -hmm. by for the farm. Anything that's industrial, commercial, mm -hmm. is a big problem. Third thing I'll say is that in terms of compost, we're very concerned about the health risks associated with bringing these type 2 materials to be able to be imported on, which mm -hmm. this bill calls for in terms of food waste, in terms of animal mortality, animal parts that can be trucked in, as well as manure. That to us is problematic and we'll continue on that. Next thing is that in terms of, you know, we've had issues with the task force and mm -hmm. we think it was a stack deck. I to. And I think that it led to this disparity and inability mm -hmm. to have our voice heard and the majority report was carried forward. We encourage you to make sure that that doesn't happen again on the mm -hmm. state, the state mm -hmm. panel. And obviously, I think okay. uh, Justin Brendel, who represented the farmers and who mm -hmm. himself has an industrial operation, mm -hmm. is there. So that's concerning, and we'll address yeah. that as we go forward. That's fine. So let me ask you the question. Sure. So uh, your campaign promise in 2014, as you stated, was to keep industrial operations off ag preserve farmland. Yet CB60 2017 was presented on your behalf, dismissing our well-documented health and safety concern. That, that, that bill passed allowing commercial sale of mulch and compost, importing of type 2 food and animal waste for compost, four total acres of mulch compost on ag preserve farmland, 10 acres of mulch compost along the Magic Mile near I-70, and no limits on truck size or frequency. My question to you, County Executive, is mm -hmm. if CB60 
with such a good bill in your opinion, why did you remove your name from CB21, which is essentially the same bill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think it's essentially the same bill, but um, I, I will tell you, CB60 was not, when it, when it finalized, was not what I wanted it to be. And when we were first putting it together, because Ted and Rick and, and, and Zach and, and Brent Rudley were meeting with our folks put it together, I was told that there was a consensus when it first happened. Uh, I know later on it turns out there wasn't, but I was told there was. You know, uh, and shame on me for not finding that for sure, but I was told that. And so uh, as my understanding, that would be something that people were willing to live with. Um, when I learned more about, especially some of the changes dealing with ag preservation and being able to uh, uh, get exempted from ag pres properties, that was not part of the bill. Um, I, I can tell you, I, had it not gone through, I would have vetoed it. Um, and so that's why I didn't sponsor the next one, because I really wasn't comfortable with what had happened. And I wanted to be able to review it and be able to see it go through and then me be able to make some changes based upon what I'd heard. So that's, where I, that's, that's kind of where it all happened. Um, but I think right now the important thing we have to do right now is to make sure that it's done in a way that everybody can be happy with. And I think we can make that happen. I really do. I'm an optimist. I think we can make that happen. I think that the amendments we started on were, were a good start. Like you had said in the paper, and Rick Lober had told me it was good progress, and Ted Mariani and I worked on it together. Uh, but I think we can do better. Yeah, so and as my final comment, I'll say yeah. that transparency, if that's something you knew in November, mm -hmm. it's been a lot of hard work to, mm -hmm. it would be nice to have known that early mm -hmm. on and convey that to the groups mm -hmm. that are opposed okay. to this. Good. So thank you. Fair, fair point, John. Fair point. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, also, CB6021 question. Thank you for your pledge to, okay. to veto mm -hmm. CB21. I should it pass. I, I want to go back to what you said uh, to Mr. Tegras because mm -hmm. it's a little bit confusing. Sure. CB60. 2017, mm -hmm. originally exempted MALF properties, and you supported that resolution as was. Mm -hmm. Now, it was amended to remove that, but in fact, what you were doing there was exempting MALF, ag preservation properties, and allowing industrial waste. And that was particularly sort of disturbing because you were well aware since 2013 about the effects on the Woodbine people. Mm -hmm of that operation. Mm -hmm. And throughout your entire term you were aware of it and how they were violating every county regulation they could find as well as mm -hmm. some Maryland regulations. So that's a little confusing. I, I, I hear you. you. And, and I can just tell you real quick, it was amended that way because I didn't realize that I don't think it should have been exempted, so that's why. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. But okay. nonetheless, sure. you sponsored it. Catch gotcha. I appreciate uh, it. The, you know, the health issue, as John brought up, is, has been an important one. And when we look at the composition of the task force, and, and maybe we can move over to CB21, or actually sure. from CB60, no time during your tenure were any of the health reports or studies ever forwarded to the Howard County Health Department for review. I wasn't aware they weren't forwarded, but okay. Well, I, I've okay. written that up a couple of times. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they were never involved in any way. They were excluded from the operation. The <laughs> last involvement they had was with the task force. Okay. Uh, that makes no sense to me. When presented with a whole bunch of health issues that are related, airborne and water contamination, to exclude the Howard County Health Department okay. makes no sense. Okay. Uh, you have a board of health that could have probably evaluated some of the materials that came in. They were excluded by basically fact. Um, you're saying you weren't aware of that. So and then we get into the composition even of the, the amendments the, where you have this small group of people that get together to try and come up with a consensus. Mm -hmm. Two of the people involved in coming up with that consensus were violating Howard County Code. I don't know if you go to traffic court and ask people who are speeding and violating traffic code how they would like to see traffic regulations written for them. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. All right. On that board that you pulled together, there was no involvement in anybody in, regarding health. Why? Why in your tenure has no one from the Howard County Health Department been involved in any of this? Okay, I, 
I don't. I can't swear they haven't been. I mean, you're saying they haven't been. I can't swear. I they have correspondence been. from yeah. the health department that okay. they were not. Okay. Then I think that's something that we do need to rectify, and we certainly can do that now. And I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. Um, I will tell you, however, going back to what you said about the the two gentlemen who have operations, uh, you heard John Tagaris talk earlier. I mean, from the very beginning, everyone felt, everyone has felt that I've talked to, that they have been pretty doing things responsibly. And so we're trying to figure out how we can make them be legitimate and try to make it work for them. And so they're, I think it makes perfect sense for them to be part of that group. And I think Rick Lober and Ted Mariani made perfect sense to be part of that group as well. Well, it's been in violation of regulations, Maryland and county, being responsible? I think that what they're doing is the folks who are around them, and, and frankly, you're actually the very first person I've heard complain about them. I've had no one complain about what their operations are. And so I'm just saying, so. so I'm not, well, I'm not complaining necessarily yeah. about their operation per se. Uh, well, I can make some, some observations. Okay, mm -hmm. there's been some issues with water contamination as well as airborne pollutants as possibly being a problem. Okay. I don't know that, I don't see that those have yeah. gone away with their operations because there was nothing in CB60 or CB21 that addressed the health risks. Even the amendment that you proposed when, and for farmers going from one acres to three acres with five foot piles, would it increase the surface area right. of the mulch piles, which would have increased airborne fungal spores and wood dust? I think that what I was told, even Mer Dr. Mr. Mariani and I talked about this one in length, and he's actually one of the ones that gave me the idea to have it be lower. And that's what he had told me. That's something that would be more acceptable to the community. And that's why I looked at it that way. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm saying. Uh, and, and, sure. Well, everyone, I, at least yeah, I've talked yeah, to, and I haven't yeah, talked to Mr. Yeah. Mariani about yeah. it, is, is mm -hmm. say, yeah, there's more mm -hmm. surface area. There's going to be more wood dust. But, no, I think it's also, but instead of having a 10-foot or 12-foot high pile, you have a 5-foot pile. I think the that surface helps. surface area I know, changes. but I think that there's actually, look, we, can, we have a discussion about that, and maybe we get some health sure. parts, and we can see. But I think that actually was a better thing than having high piles okay. and three acres. See, before... How did, well, how did going from one acre to three acres affect water contamination risk? I don't have those studies, but I know that there are studies that we can look at those. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm saying... Well, you've got one, the Suffolk have. County report. Yep, yeah. and that's one thing we And there were at. 11 sites that were studied in that, and the smallest mm -hmm. one that had water contamination was 1.1 acres. Mm -hmm. And I know there's been some criticism of the Suffolk County report, and I actually heard just someone told me recently today that, that actually the Suffolk County regulations are less strict than ours are after they had that report? Well, some of the, when you look at the manganese levels that were I'm involved, just, they're well above EPA standards. Yeah, I'm just saying, but if it's true that the Suffolk County re regulations based upon their report are less restrictive than ours, that's something that's interesting. I mean, I, I, one could, you know, I still hear people complain that smoking doesn't cause cancer, <coughs> and that hasn't been proved yet. You know, so there's always somebody that can find or pretend to be a flaw. Mm -hmm. When Mr. Danis testified that there wasn't any water contamination at Alpha Ridge, he neglected to mention that that site had been engineered so that there wouldn't be any leachate leakage. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in CB60 or CB21 yeah, that would prevent. Can I say something? In respect to others. Okay. I appreciate you. Thank you for. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, and I appreciate your passion. I yeah. understand why. Do you want Antigone? You want to mention something? Sure. Why don't you come forward because they're going to have to hear. Right. Yeah. So I, just to add some information to this. So make sure close uh, enough. Yeah. The health department was involved in the task force. We had. Right. Hey, and take, right. Get really close because they can't hear in the back. Yeah. So the health department was involved in the task force. Do I turn this around? That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was involved in the, the task force. We had less involvement after the task force, but I do want to clarify that in November we were approached, the Board of Health was approached, the Board of Health was given a packet of information, the Board of Health uh, then gave that to the Health Department in early December and the Health Department did send inspectors to prop at least one property did collect samples and we right. did provide follow-up to that. The data did not suggest at the time that there were um, levels that were found to be concerning. So I just did want to clarify Thank you that very the, much. the Board of Your Health Secretary. was involved and notified of this and provided no, some feedback. <laughs> Did the task force? Well, we did revisit the task force information at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So I just thank you, thank you. I appreciate. It. I know we've been long. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And thanks for clarifying that to make sure people know the health department was involved. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Kittle. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Fine. Good. Good to finally talk to you. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, I live over on the other side of 108, <clears throat> and um, like a lot of people in this county, I work my butt off during the day. I come home at night. I want to have my cocktail. I want to have a little pasta. I want to watch a little TV. You Ted Mary, I want to take out the I want to, I want to go to yeah. bed. You know, and that's yeah. all. Yeah. I find myself, this is another CB21 question, okay, sure. but I find myself having spent now Monday night after Monday night after Monday night till the wee hours of the morning sitting out there listening to all this nonsense over and over and over again. <clears throat> and one of the things that struck me, and it's a little bit of what he was just talking about, is that there has been some incredible testimony from some really reputable physicians and scientists and environmental experts about the, the just sheer danger of this bill, the craziness of this bill, and what it's going to do to our health and our environment, what have you. Just as one guy talking, I don't see the county investing in a similar set of expert witnesses and expert studies that kind of, kind of, kind of either disprove that or provide another point of view. There's something imbalanced here about where the data is coming from and how serious the studies are being taken, at least in my opinion. Okay. So I would, I would ask you, okay, so sure. okay. I would ask you to take a look at whether or not you're getting the best possible advice from really objective resources that know something about okay. how, how the air is going to be affected, how our water is going to be affected, okay. how where our health is going to be affected, how our, our kids are going to be affected. No, I appreciate the suggestion. I know that. Councilman Sigurdi, I know, had, and I guess Councilman Fox had folks from MDE and, and University of Maryland come in, but I don't know all the details that, that they had. I don't think they brought them in. I think the other side brought No, them. no, no. The, 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 I know the council people brought a couple of them, at least. I don't know. Okay. But anyway, thank you. It's a good suggestion. Thank you for bringing it up to me. Yes. Hi. How are you? Hi. I'm Jeff Peterson, and Hi. I'm here because I'm... Make sure you... Uh, yeah. Is it on? No, it might be on, but... I'm, is it, go ahead. Okay. Is, is it on? Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. I can yes. hear myself, yes. too. Eureka. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Beaverson, and I'm um, from the North Laurel area, oh, okay. and here because I'm concerned about the development of the milk co-op. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard, mm -hmm. there's about 383 homes that are being put in in that area yeah. with only two access roads, mm -hmm. um, one going out on scenic Gorman Road, mm -hmm. the other one on Leisure. The schools in that area are already full, um, and there's no plan in place to set aside land even yeah. at the milk co-op where there's land available for new schools. In addition, it's one of the communities, like many in that area, that have been developed as isolated communities. They're not connected. Uh, there will be students in that development that are bused a quarter mile to the nearest school, and it just does not make sense. Um, the increase in the traffic, the impact on the schools, and the safety concerns are detracting from the livability that all of us covet when we come to Howard County. So I want to know, um, as a concerned citizen, mm -hmm. how are you going to address this? How are you going to mitigate the strain that all of the development, and I, I get development happens, but Southeast mm -hmm. needs support in mm -hmm. the development in keeping the good parts of Howard County and not just develop yeah. as fast as we can. I appreciate that. Can I I'll talk a little bit about because I know we haven't gotten anything from them officially. Correct. Right, they've only and done the pre-submission. Yeah, and so I mean it's a little early for us to be able to. We have to wait and get see what they tell us. Um, I don't know if you want to share that, but also, um, you know, the underlying zoning. They're not asking for zoning change. Correct. And so with the underlying zoning, then you know we have the AFO. Now it's been a little, a little tightened up some. I mean that's what's got to be our gauge, and we have to look at the AFO with the, with the, the new traffic restrictions. I know that. Um, uh, that maybe Val can share because I know that that with the new traffic it'll be expanded where they'll have to look at what intersections have to look at then of course the schools test now includes the high school too but okay. perfect height for the mic yeah good 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 um, so uh, so the property in question is uh, 120 acre, 121 acres and it's zoned uh, RSC and R20 which are basically residential zones and those properties were rezoned, uh, there's a 30 acre parcel that was rezoned from R12 to R20 back in 1985. Uh, another one was 20 acres was rezoned from M1 which is a industrial district to RSC um, and that occurred in 2004 and then 86 acres were rezoned from PEC which is uh, again a, a planned employment um, area to uh, RSC, which is a residential district, in 2004 as well. And, and so these properties have been zoned that way, and under that existing zoning, they have a right to develop. So the questions that you pose about traffic, um, Mr. Kittleman talked about APFO, and other people have mentioned APFO. 
under the new APFO regulations. The traffic test is being tightened up, and so um, while there hasn't been a formal submittal, the developers have come in and uh, they've met with our engineering division within the Department of Planning and Zoning. And um, our engineering group has already an identified which intersections will need to be tested. And nothing will move forward until um, the development impacts to those intersections are, are mitigated. From the school perspective, um, Again, under APFO, the schools will be tested. If the schools are over capacity, that development project will not move forward until that is rectified. Uh, there is a wait period. They will get tested um, every year. And on the fifth test, unless the, if the schools have not been resolved, if the Board of Education has not you know, upgraded the school situation, then the development can move forward, and that's in the current um, updated APFO legislation. So they have every right to develop this property, um, and, and that's just the way that the land use regulations work. So. And the way that works, as you know, just to confirm this, it's the fifth year, but then they still take some probably two or three years to get the development that, done. That, that, so that's it correct. Be, like so years, it's, so it's yeah. five, five years, uh, the fifth test, they come out of the, um, what's called the bin, and at that point, there's still about another two to three years before development goes online. So, um, you know, they have property rights to be able to do that at this point, and they've had that zoning for quite some time, in, in some cases, more than 30 years. So, so what I can tell you is what we will make sure happens is that everything is followed. You know, you know one thing that some people talk about is with development stuff, I can tell you, we've looked at numbers, and there used to be a big issue with waivers and people getting waivers to do certain things. Uh, my administration for the last three years has given less waivers than the previous administration did, and actually less waivers are being asked. And I can tell you why. Because the, the reputation I have is I'm a rule follower. And so you don't ask for a waiver if you know the response is going to be no, the rule says this. And so I think that's been a good thing for us. Um, but I think you want to say something else. I just, I want to clarify. It. From my perspective as a, yeah. as a citizen, I'm very aware of the APFO um, yeah. and I'm aware of the roads test. However, f for those who don't understand, that's a one-day test that they do either Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday doing peak hours. So it does not take into account all of the intricacies of each community. So yes, there is a test, mm -hmm. but it's not a rigorous and extensive test that truly assesses the community. Okay. So my concern is I not so much that, that there's APFO, I, I completely understand there's a riot of development. I'm asking you to stand up and lead this community and this county in creating stricter or more stringent, more community-based regulations and advocate for the community. Because yes, the developer has the right to develop. I'm living there. I have, a, I'm impacted by his right to develop. I, I, I completely agree with you on that one. I understand where you're coming from. Um, I would say, though, that we just went through a long APFO process, and a lot of people in this room are part of that process, and it was strengthened, and that's what the community and actually was strengthened harder than I think most, I'm sure, developers wanted to have. And so I'm not king, and you have rules. And for example, I know Shun Liu is here. I saw her in the back. I don't know if she's still here or not. Um, the Donaldson Funeral Home on Route 108. I didn't think it should go there. And when I took office, it sat on my desk. One of the first things that came to my desk is, you need to sign this paper to allow them to go forward. I said, well, we've got to go back and make sure everything has been done properly, to make sure there weren't any waivers done that should have been done, to make sure there's no water quality issues that we could do. We, have, we brought MDE out. A year and a half later, a year and a half later, I was told, you need to sign this or we're going to get sued because you have nothing else to say why you're delaying them. So I just want you to know, so I do that. I do whatever I can, but I'm not king. So if the rule says they can do it and they followed all the regulations, I can't just say, no, you can't. And so what I can do is to make sure and look at every stone, to figure out every way to make it the best it could possibly be, but I don't want to offer any guarantee because if they follow everything, I can't just say no because literally they can. So I think I want to say so. Got to come back over here because they can't hear you. Yeah. So um, that was one of the first things when I came on board in, in Howard County was to look at our development regulations, 
and, um, and, and there are a number of people in the audience who have participated in what, what's called an assessment of Howard County's uh, development regulations. We finished that phase uh, this past spring, and so we're going to be kicking off uh, later this summer the second phase, which is a complete rewrite of Howard County's development regulations. So anybody who has not participated in that, I really would encourage you to do that. Um, I noticed um, there are a number of flaws, and we have a 95-page assessment that identifies what works, what doesn't work, what, what needs to be fixed. Um, so please come out during that process. Um, the rules can't be changed today. It's going to take a while. But, but the goal really is to have clear, more understandable development regulations that look at responding to the character of certain areas in the county. So, And also just to let you know, also just to let you know, I am the very first eighth grade class of Hammond Middle School. So I know the area and I appreciate your bringing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Go Hammond. Go Hammond. I didn't go to the high school, I went to the middle school. I went to Athens for the high school. Thanks. Yes, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Hi, yeah, make sure you get closer so I can hear you. Yeah. Hi, thank you for taking my question. No, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Peppa Sassin, and I recently purchased a brand new home in Oxford Square, Hanover. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, eco-friendly, LEED certified community. Just to find out that the jet airways are streaming right above our heads. So there's elementary school, there's middle school, and you could imagine windows are rattled, mm -hmm. there's no sleep, there's nothing. I contacted governor's office, AG's office, and they all pointed out in your direction. So oh, really? That's interesting. Some movement going on there. Because I, I do control the airport, uh, folks. I, I just want to know. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're the voice of citizens. Mm -hmm. And I looked at some of the reports that were out there. Um, I'm a chemist for the EPA, so I have the ability to interpret data. And the report that was submitted for evaluation mm -hmm. is pretty much bogus report. Mm -hmm. So it was based on old data. Uh, the current noise level exceeds 85 decibels in some of the areas of the community. So I would like to know, knowing the history of, of the problem and knowing what steps have been taken, the roundtable discussions, what are your next steps to protect the citizens okay. uh, of that particular part of the country? No, I appreciate you bringing it up, and it's something that we've been working on, and I know Ms. Terraza was here, I'm sure she's here not, but she's been a big part of that, and the county council voted to work with the county executive and to help bring a lawsuit and or bring legal action I shouldn't say right. uh, to do that so we're working on that locally uh, we also governor Hogan that's why I think it's a so funny governor Hogan wrote to the con to the attorney general Frost asking him to sue the FAA right. and I wrote a letter and I believe the council rights board too asking him to sue the FAA because it's the federal aviation administration can right. make this change uh, but the Howard County Council can, Howard County Executive cannot make that change. And so all we can do is fight to get that to be heard. And so what our office, our, uh, our local council will be doing is trying to get them to reconsider the regulations that were changed. And so we're working on that and we're trying to get the state of Maryland to sue as well. So those are what we can do. And that's, and I'm just being honest, I mean, when you have the Federal Aviation Administration, there's not a whole lot a local county can do. We can scream from the top of the mountains, and it's the federal government, and we have to get support from our federal legislators and from our state legislators and state government to push on this as well. And, and we're pushing, and I know that John Weinstein is pushing, I know that Calvin Ball and all the people from, the, from that area and others have are, are been pushing. So we're doing it. It's just, you know, we have a certain amount of leverage on that. Yeah, I'm just here as a very concerned oh, citizen I, representing my community I, and many others affected no, I, there's by no the question. North. It's just disaster and livable It is, and, I, and, yeah. and when everybody shifts the ball to the other party, it no. becomes a bit frustrating for the one mm. suffering. So, no. Well, and I appreciate that, and I can tell you, I know of at least one family who's moved because of it. They've talked to me about it. There may be more. Um, and it's very, very frustrating to me as well, and it makes it even more frustrating to see things that you can control. Right. You, can, you can get frustrated about it and try to make things happen, but things you can't control, you really get frustrated because you have no control over it. And so we continue to work very hard, and we will continue to work very hard, and I know it's uh, very frustrating and hard and difficult to live, but I don't want you to think that we've forgotten about it, but we're doing what we have and our, our ability to do. No, just last comment, yeah. AG's office, they, they said that they're dealing with the law firm who addressed the Chicago 
uh, O'Hare Airport issue, and okay. I don't know where this stands, but apparently mm -hmm. the issue was mitigated there by um, uh, the purchase uh, of the soundproof windows mm -hmm. for all residents. I don't know if this will ever be an option, but know. just bringing it up. But that actually is something that makes sense, though. I mean. Even yeah. even us as the local county, Mind. we have hired somebody who's already worked somewhere else to help us as well. Yeah. It makes sense to go to people who've already been successful and know what they're doing. So. Correct. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for bringing it forward to us. Congratulations on your award. Too. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. First of all, I want to say a thank you because uh, sidewalks are coming to Ellicott City, and this is wonderful news. We're starting the process. You now. are, and I'm very grateful because I love to walk to the Miller Library with my little ones, so we're yeah. excited about that. Good. So thank you. Um, Another, it's a thank you, but a concern. Mm -hmm. I just believe in education. There are certain tenants that, or tenants of education that we should, are kind of basic. Mm -hmm. So for school sizes, school classroom sizes, it was great news to hear that we got 500,000 to protect our class sizes for the Title I schools, because they are the most vulnerable population. So we all celebrate that. But we're still concerned about everyone else, because that does affect the education. And the way Howard County looks at it is that should be basic. So keep fighting for us all, okay. but thank you for the 500. Okay. DPZ, you are here, so I wanna say two things to you. We wanna, as far as the community, echo our Board of Education's plea to make school sites part of the initial planning process and that our schools are not afterthoughts of reacting to population. Okay. Also, I would love that green infrastructure networks are on our initial development plans because it's the right thing to do, but also fiscally responsible, so we don't have to remediate environmental issues we could have avoided if we just plan correctly. And that's a good thing to be part of the zoning. Yes, yeah. and I'm on the Plan Howard Academy. Last good. session is Tuesday, good. so I look to be involved in that as well. So school board, school sites, green infrastructure network. My question to you, Yes, ma'am. school impact fees. Mm -hmm. I talked to you after the state of county, and I always appreciate your transparency. So after I spoke to you, I also talked to Eric Abelsall mm -hmm. and Guy Gazone. Mm -hmm. So I think that everybody is on the same page that we're ready to look at next session. The chairperson is gonna be Terry Hill in okay. July. Okay. I wanna make sure I understand very clearly, when is the deadline for your request to go in for that bill to be put forth? That's my first. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do for us to ensure it does not die on the vine? And we let, I mean, we've left hundreds of million dollars on the table for our schools. So sure. when does the request deadline sure. get in? Sure. And then how are you collaborating with the delegation to make sure we get it done? Fine, good, good, good question, good question. I appreciate that. And I served 10 years on the delegation. I know, I'm um, looking for that experience no, to work and so, for us. And so, but my point being is election years are different. Yes, they are. Usually it's like September. But because of an election year, it may not be until after the election. Well, it has to be because you could have new delegates and you get new senators. And so I don't know that date. We can find it. The people who can tell you that date are the state delegation because they set that. I don't set that. Um, and so I would assume it would probably be sometime in November or it could even be December this year because of the election. Uh, but I know that that's a discussion. I'm glad you talked to uh, Delegate Eversall and, and Senator Gazzoni because we have had those discussions. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that that is going to be what's going to happen in the next session. And also, just so you know, it doesn't have to be from me. Uh, the delegation can do it on their own. Um, but I just want to make sure we, we, we need to work together, though. I just don't want you to think it's just me. They could also do it. I do want to clarify something, though. Yeah. They seem like they're very much in favor with giving the local control here. But here's what they need from you. And this is coming from all of mm -hmm. them. They need guidance as far as what range. They said they will not hand over just a blank really? range. Yes, they did. So what you need to help or whoever is in office yep. after the elections, mm -hmm. We need to get it right with what they're looking yeah. for. Give us control, but they said we will not just order it, carte blanche, go for it. Okay. But they need a range. Gotcha. So we have to be prepared. And if we need research, we need to start it now. Because as we've seen, mm -hmm. the APFO task force and the revision mm -hmm. was a campaign promise four years ago, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it takes a while. So I just want to make sure that whoever needs to do that reaches out now. What do they need? Mm -hmm. And if it's research, let's get it done now. Can't afford to let it die again. Thank you. Chris. Do I have your commitment for sure, that? Sure, of course, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank you listening. so much. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Good to see you. Hey, Chris. 
Hi, Alan. How are you doing tonight? I'm fine. How are you? Good. I'm an opera. Warm weather. You're wearing shorts, I guess. Indeed. Yeah. It's a real change. We, we lost spring. Yeah. And I, I don't know where it went. But yeah. I'm an optimist just like you, and I wanted to just tell you, I want to commend you and the council for the work on the public-private partnership with the new courthouse. Mm -hmm. But there are concerns with the zoning in the Oakland Ridge Industrial Park, okay. which is where the courthouse is located. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of those buildings along Route 108 have been foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, <clears throat> and this could be a solution, um, the way that the Department of Planning and Zoning is handling the NT zone, they are using it like M1 and saying that it's a buy right use. Well, there's no buy right uses in the NT zone, or in floating zones. It means that we could put a mulching facility right at the gateway to the courthouse. And I don't think that you would really like that. I don't think it'd be good for the courthouse project. Mm -hmm. It might solve the pr problem of these fellows over mm -hmm. here, but it wouldn't be good yeah. for the county. <laughs> and <clears throat> there are several uh, buildings, there was a used car lot talked about at the Oak Tree Furniture. Okay. And the people in Glenmont were all very upset about it. And all that area borders on Oakland Mills, mm -hmm. Glenmont, and Long Beach. And now, because the Department of Planning and Zoning is treating the NT zone, the floating zone, like a by right Euclidean zone, those people are at risk. And that's not how it's supposed to be handled. And I'm sure that you do not want to have a mulching facility or a recreational village, a, uh, a vehicle storage area. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Is there a way for you to begin to enforce section 125D6, which locks in the uses and would immediately alleviate this problem? Because it's already on the books. Okay, let me, let me get the expert over here. Come on, Val, you know better than I do, so I wanna make sure you... <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hi, Val. How are you? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I'm not an attorney, but every time I talk to Chris, where's my attorney? Because <laughs> I, I need them to interpret what it is that Chris says. Um, I, you know, I, I think that the Office of Law and, and Chris perhaps are on different, different sides of the page on this particular issue. Um, and we've, we've had this conversation in the quarterly meetings when we meet with, uh, with HCCA, and Chris has raised this a number of times. Um, I, I tell you what I'll do, Chris. I, I will uh, talk to Paul Johnson. Um, I'll, I'll get a read from him. I believe that Paul has already come out with uh, a legal opinion on this. And, and I think it supports the position that the Department of Planning and Zoning has taken. Like I said, I'm not an attorney, but I listen to what the attorneys say when it comes to land use law. And so happy to do that. I'll, I'll talk to Paul, um, hopefully s still tomorrow, to see if we can set up a meeting and clarify this. So. Okay. And, and if Paul doesn't, 125D6 is very clear. It's only three sentences, and anybody can read it. It says, after the development plan is recorded, no new structures shall be built, no alterations made. And that locks in the use, and that's the protection. And I would suggest to you, I don't know what Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson is not very forthcoming. Um, I'm sure he does a great job, but I have never had this question answered. I have asked it, okay. Val laughed, but I've asked it and I've never had the question okay. answered. And barring Mr. Johnson, perhaps we can get the Attorney General's office to weigh in on an opinion. The Attorney General's office is very capable, and I've read their opinions on land use matters, and they're very capable at it. The people in Oakland Ridge and Glenmont and Long Beach are concerned about this. Okay. I'll yeah, I'll and I, I guess I just beg to differ, and so I'm happy to, I, happy I understand to where talk you're coming to from. I'm a mediator here. I understand where you're coming from, and so let us talk to them. But I'm an attorney as well, and, and there's a lot of different ways, a lot of times, to interpret things, and so. I think 125D6 couldn't I know, be clear. I know, I know you think it that way, but. There must, I mean, there must be some other kind of interpretation or they wouldn't be saying that, so I have to learn more about it. Well, if, uh, um, show me, I'm, I'm okay. from so, Missouri. Hey, Thank you're you. Missouri, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Chris, Thank you. How are you? Good Hi, to see you again. I'm good. I'm yeah. not an attorney at all. Nah. So this is a grand adventure for me. <laughs> so uh, my name's Erin Allen, yes, and am, yeah. yeah, we've met a couple mm -hmm. million times before. Um, and as you know, mm -hmm. that uh, I, Grew up here in Howard County. I've been here for 34 years. 
and you're the very first Republican I've ever voted for in my life. Wow. <laughs> and I'm going to say there's a few people in this room that could probably say the same thing. Um, but here we go. Sure. So in March of 2017, a giant tractor trailer full of mulch struck and killed two little kids getting on a bus in rural Virginia. Um, the driver of the truck wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just carrying a giant load of mulch weighing 75,000 pounds. After you say he wasn't doing anything wrong. I mean, he was. He didn't do anything wrong driving. I was only sure. I yeah, he wasn't. Okay. To my, I don't. It was like they was... ran across. Okay. No, yeah, okay. no. He just couldn't stop. Gotcha. I can't. I'll make sure. No. Yeah. Right yeah. After the work session last week, I guess it was for CB21. It seems obvious, and 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 you mm -hmm. also shared this that really CB21 seems to be trying to bring into regulation the couple of guys that are currently operating outside of mm -hmm. of regulations, operating illegally. If Fox and Sigety don't stand down, which mm -hmm. I suspect they will probably not, um, what are you going to do to prevent those giant vehicles on our little tiny rural roads? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said earlier, um, first of all, I think it will be withdrawn. I'm guessing. I think it will be. Uh -huh. I, I have any proof? That I can't say it will. Um, but uh, I, I, I will not support any bill. Now, it's interesting, <laughs> though. I think it's important for people to realize that. One way to try to stop it is by not allowing certain uses on it, not having truck sizes involved, that's but right. having the uses on it. And that's what I was trying to do with my amendments, at least starting to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's my goal, was to try to figure out how we can do it so that there won't be any need for a truck to be there. Not that the trucks can't be there, right. but as you all know, uh, there are already trucks that come through for other sure. reasons. For, for sure. you know, I, for two farmers uh, farm my property, Absolutely. and there's some big trucks that come down Massive. our driveway, right. and that's going to happen. So we, so we're not going to get rid of all trucks. Certainly not. Um, and so, uh, so, but that's that's kind of where I am. And, and if it's not amended to a way that I feel comfortable, and I've already expressed some of my concerns, then I'll veto it. And might I suggest, and I think that this is something that uh, Mr. Lober and mm -hmm. Mr. Mariani have suggested as well, is. You know, it's one thing for the giant trucks to go into the farm, right, to mm -hmm. give them the compost and the mulch that they perhaps mm -hmm. need. It's a whole other ball of wax for them to take that mulch off of I their farms. You. I hear you. So, you know, mm -hmm. let them take it in. But if they can't yeah. take it out, then we're not talking about industry anymore, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about supporting the farm. Right. And, and I completely agree with that, especially on mulch. The compost, I think there's some other issues because the nutrient management plant, they have right. to deal with their excess, and I think there's other things we have to look at, uh, but I, I agree with you on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Good to see you again, Aaron. Thanks. Good to see you. Hey, Mr. Long, how are you? I'm good. Good to see you. I am so thrilled that you're thinking about removing the CB21 from mm -hmm. legislation. You might want to get a little closer, even though I can hear you. Though. I'm, I'm sure that all of Woodbine is going to be thrilled that you're removing CB21 from legislation. Mm -hmm. I never could really comprehend how mulch or the compost had anything to do with farming in the first place, and that you being a farm well, boy, I'm, I, raised on a farm. Okay, I wouldn't call myself a farm boy, but yeah. As, okay. I'll tell you real quick, as Vernon Gray used to say, that, Alan, uh, you live on a farm, but you're not a farmer. Okay, I, yeah, yeah. I don't believe I've ever seen or any, ever heard of a farmer spreading mulch across his bean, corn, or wheat fields. My dad uh, did that when I was a kid. Mulch. He put it across almost our entire field. Actually, my dad did sludge. They came from the landfill, and they put it all across. And as the spring would come, you see all those little tomato plants come up because those are the seeds that survived. Well, I, and, I yeah. did a I did a talk about the sludge. That was that was a big thing, but it mm -hmm. was very environmentally. I'm just saying. I'm not unsafe. saying it was a good thing to do, but that's what they did when I was a kid. So yeah. It did a lot of harm to people and their animals. Anyway, so I have this question for you: As citizens. We forced the DPZ to reopen a case that they admitted to closing prematurely and investigate violations at the Bonner Oak Ridge Maryland Ag Farm. If DPZ can't or won't enforce even the current regulations and is relying on average citizens to police these regulations, how will they be able to enforce, for example, pile heights and the 5% percentage of material only allowed to be trucked off for commercial sale as per your amendments proposed right. for CB21. Right. Um, I can tell you 
that they can't, I, I believe they can enforce, and we do, are complaint driven, and so I'm glad that you have kept vigilant because that's what we need. Um, but I think that they, they can, and I think that as we continue to get the complaints, I mean, they had a, the case and then they did close it and they reopened it based on your comments. I remember sitting at the table with me, you showed me the pictures. Um, and so I believe they can. Um, I think that you'll see that there'll probably be some more amendments if this goes forward of trying to make stronger enforcement. Uh, I think that there are other council members who are talking about that, that I've had some discussions with, should it go forward. Uh, so I think there are ways in which we're trying to figure out better how to make it happen. And also figure out ways to maybe even get the mayor and the Department of Environment to be a little more involved and help us in some of the monitoring. Of it. Well, have you appointed an accounting firm to keep track of the 5% or whatever hasn't of, passed of yet, what Rob. these farmers are going to do? It hasn't passed yet, but that apparently they already have to, what I understand is they have to give a report to the uh, the Maryland Department of Environment, so we can look at that report and then go from what they have and, and deal with this. So there are ways we can look at, but I understand your point, and it certainly would be something we'd have to have the personnel to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank, no, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out. Hey, Ms. Shane. How are How you? How are you? I'm Very here good. to talk about cluster zoning. Okay. And as you know, it's been my thing. I've yes. introduced you to the county and put mm. the first cluster. <clears throat> can I share some real quick? I, I want to. No. Just so I know, we have to be out by nine. Is that right? I just want to make sure I understand <coughs> that. Is that true? I just want, if it's not, we can be a little longer. Is that true? Jackie or somebody else? Jackie, I, we, we can go a little uh, Okay, because I'm just thinking, we've got some people in line here, so. There might be the people are in line now that we can get questions from. We might not be able to go past it because by the time we get through this, it might be nine. Okay, go ahead. I just would like to say I think Howard County has not taken cluster zoning seriously. And the things that it's really evaluated on, we have not looked at. And we need to tighten up the zoning regulations. And since that's what we're about right mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. that's what I'm here for. Okay, good. And, for example, as you probably know, Paternal Gift won lots of different awards. And they always say it's for design excellence, which means the home sites should be taking advantage of this open space for their good views. And the open space should be used wisely. And for value, and I would just say Paternal Gift is a working farm. In fact, our budget for the year made 100, the income was $128,500. So we are a working farm as a cluster developer. And um, I would like to know that Thou is going to tighten up regulations and know that the open space is really, really valuing the existing community and the new community and productive. They yell at me if you don't come up there. Come on. <laughs> No, I do. I'm yeah. trusting you, but we yeah. need to tighten up the regulations. I, I don't want to brag, but my former firm, we designed Paterno Glyph Park. <laughs> so. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank now, you. Well, I think it's important, Sue, is that it will be something that we'll look at because the community is going to be very involved in this. It's not like it's going to be someone sitting in a, in a room by themselves doing this. We had, I think, 40 public engagement meetings with the first round of it. We'll certainly have that as much or more. We had 460 people involved. I think we had 700 comments, all just in that first phase. And so we'll definitely make sure that happens during the... <clears throat> Let me just yeah. say what. I would just like to say I've invited you out to Paternal mm -hmm. Gift. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. not seen you. I've invited you mm -hmm. to Paternal Gift. I invited mm -hmm. HCCA to Paternal Gift. Mm -hmm. I've invited many people, and usually mm -hmm. they go in the entrance off of 108 mm -hmm. and think they've seen Paternal Gift. Paternal Gift is surrounded by Hall Shop Road, 108, mm -hmm. 216, with yeah. seven barns, a pond, Every barn has to have electricity, it has to have water. You have to think it takes money to develop the open space. It has a two-mile asphalt walking path for exercises. Jim Rouse was my hero, and I was taking him to the county. And that's what I would like okay. you to think about. All right? So, so very quickly, um, that was one of the comments that Actually, I heard from you about um, taking a look at um, the pattern of cluster subdivisions in the rural west. And, and that's something that we included as part of the code assessment. And that's something that, you know, I'm all about high quality design. Um, we, right now, our regulations don't drive high quality design in those cluster situations. So that's something we're going to be looking at. Thank you, Sue. Thanks for bringing it up, Sue. I appreciate that. Yep, I live right next door, a cluster subdivision, so. Can oh. I introduce myself to you? Sure, of course. 
I'm a newcomer. I've only been here 30 years. I'm Alan. Well, I've only been here 60. Okay. Well, that's yeah. good. Hello, everybody. I've come here from Singapore. I lived overseas 18 years. I helped the U.S. Army for four years as a chaplain. And um, it just came to my attention a little while ago. There was just around the corner from where I live, there is going to be a mulch factory down there. And uh, I did a little checking, and I was told that it's because they got this approved for a farm. Well, now, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. We had five tractors and a lot of Holstein cattle. And when I was a small boy, I thought every boy had a pony. You know, I thought he had a Shetland pony. Well, I grew up, and then I went to college and so forth. And I've become a pastor and been overseas. Now, I am not in favor of this mulch right around the corner from my house. You know, I know something about mulch. It has to be tended and so forth. It can catch on fire. Did you know that? And so forth. Is that, do you, are you aware of that? On our farm, we had to be very careful when you bring in hay because it can catch on fire and so forth. And I grew up on a farm. We had a lot of, a lot of cattle and so forth and five tractors and so forth. And the reason I came tonight is I'd like to make an appeal sure. that we do not have any mulch anywhere in this county. Could someone say amen to that? Amen. How much would, would you want to agree with that? Put up your hands. Would you agree with that? Yes. I've been to every meeting except one. I had to go. I'm a preacher, and I had to go to a preach to a new church over in Iowa. And, um, but I'm back again, and I'm glad to be here with you tonight. Nice to but you. I'd like to ask that we, we really seriously look at this. This mulch thing is something that is bad news for us, folks. You've got to find a place away from it. Now, my wife and I came here from Singapore. We were overseas for 18 years. And we looked around here for a place, and we picked a lovely spot out here. And we built a house, and we built a barn, and uh, we, we have our machinery in there, a couple of tractors, of course, and so forth, and so on. Yet we don't put our machinery in the rain, of course not. Well, anyway, that's my Thank appeal. You. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate you listening to me. Of course. But I, go ahead. No, I was going to say, where are you from in Iowa? Well, 50 miles west of Des Moines. My dad was raised in Storm Lake and Somerset. Well, Iowa is quite a state. Some of you may not know that the whole Midwest, the whole Midwest has made education priority. Iowa has had the SAT scores for years, for 50 years, and number two is North Dakota. Did you know that? Probably you didn't know that. But the whole Midwest, and I have a PhD out there in Nebraska, and then after that, I just got another one in, over in, in Chicago. But nevertheless, folks, this mulch thing really needs to be looked at again. And at the times when I, I've been there, and the little buzzer goes off about the time we get started, and you don't have a chance to finish. And I I'm know, letting you finish. Um, I know you, you will. Okay, I will run Thank away you from for now. But don't run, but to walk. Okay. Blessings went. Well, I won't walk because I was in a bad car accident in Kingston, Jamaica, and uh, really ruined my knee. Ruined my anyway. Want me to help you your seat? You know no. what? It might be nice. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I know. Blessings on you. Blessings to you, too. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kittleman, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity and this uh, interaction. Thank you. I come here as a citizen, a scientist, and a physician. Mm -hmm. I'm a neurologist at Johns Hopkins. I run the clinical core section of the Alzheimer's Disease Center over there. Mm -hmm. And I'm very concerned about this industrial mulching bill <coughs> and the lack of any systematic study of the health effects of such industrial scale mulching in close proximity to schools and families. We already have heard about the issue of water contamination from even small mulching facilities. And the water contamination is serious. It's manganese. And people may not know, but manganese toxicity can lead to Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. The air pollution associated with these farms from the increased traffic is going to increase Alzheimer's disease. About one in every five people with Alzheimer's disease, the underlying cause is air pollution. Increasingly, air pollution has also been shown to increase the risk of autism. So you can imagine as a neurologist, there are three conditions, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, autism, that have the potential to be affected from these kinds of industrial scale mulching. And there has been no systematic study of what this will do to 
people who live close by. Mm. So I remain very concerned about the lack of any formal study, the lack of the Depart Howard County Department of Health having a say on this, and the, Medial and the Department of uh, Environment. So okay. thank you. Thank you for sharing that. But I think uh, Ms. Vigory did talk about the Department of Health, did have some say in this, so I just want to make sure okay. that that doesn't get out. Thank you, though. And thank you for being involved. I've, I know you've been involved. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Garber. Good evening. Good evening, Susan. Thanks for coming to HCCA night. Every year. Every year. I wanted to make sure you were aware that recently some members of the Patuxent River Commission, as well as an employee from the Fish and Wildlife Service, reviewed the two plans and walked the property for the settlement at Savage Mill. We say the two plans. We say the two plans? The two plans. The so, one that's entirely on their own five okay, acres, or the swamp, okay. as well as the okay, one gotcha. that includes the swamp. Thank you. Okay. They all agreed that the Little Patuxent River is more likely to be damaged by the swamp plan. Okay. okay. And as a former member of the Patuxent River mm -hmm. Commission, when you were a council member, mm -hmm. I wonder how you can justify allowing development on what the state has declared a targeted ecological area, meaning it's the best of the best, the most sensitive of environmental lands. So how you can permit that to happen and how you can consider swapping federally funded parkland. Okay. And uh, just to reiterate, I'm, I'm not sure the full swap will happen. Uh, we're still talking about that. Uh, so are you saying, I just want to make sure I understand, are you saying that the swap is what they're saying, are you saying that both plans they don't think should go forward? I, I didn't understand, I'll make sure I understand. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for the Fish and Wildlife Service in terms mm -hmm. of both, mm -hmm. but there are many on the Patuxent River Commission, as well as the Sierra Club, mm -hmm. who feel neither should okay. go forward. Okay, I appreciate that. I, I mean, I understand the swap issue. Uh, the other issue, though, is there is an online zoning, just like I said with the previous person, I can't go and say you can't do it if, they, if the zoning allows it to happen, they follow, follow all the regulations. But, but I appreciate you sharing that. I had heard a little bit about the R Protection Road Commission, but I hadn't heard that much. Okay, so the existing zoning laws would cover the development on the original parcel, mm -hmm. but the swap mm -hmm. is a totally I different that. situation. I understand. Right. But, it, but also, just everyone, that swap was brought to us by the community. It wasn't like we said we want to do it. Someone came to us and brought it to us. So that's all. And, okay. And we've discussed the I know we have. That. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Mr. Mackey, how are you? How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I'm Danny Mackey. Um, are you? I grew up in Howard County. Um, went to Wild Lake High School. Graduated I was going to say you're Wildcat. Yeah, I'm Wildcat. I'm also a candidate for Board of Education, so I'm going to ask you a little uh, education-related things. Okay. I'd like to reiterate what um, Ms. Fisher said about um, being part of the overall Howard County General Plan. Mm -hmm. um, the Board of Education is obviously its own entity, and I really appreciate your reputation as a rule follower, and you do tend to stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. But with such a complicated and large county, I mean, we're not a small rural county anymore. You know that. You grew up in a small rural county, but it's not that you way anymore. You call me old. <laughs> Someone, a high schooler called me old the other day. Yeah. So if someone called you old, that's pretty bad. Okay. Yeah, that makes you, I don't know what that nah, makes you. Thanks a lot. But okay. uh, the, the question I have, it's twofold, is one, can we work out some kind of relationship between the Board of Education and the Council and the County Executive's Office that's a little more integral in terms of getting the county government's help in this planning process so that the schools truly are integrated. Would you be willing well, I'm to? I'm fine with that. I mean, seriously, I know that uh, Jen Charles, they meet, what, at quarterly, Jen? You meet with the, with the Board of Education? But, and I know that Jeff Brown now from our office works very closely with Renee came in and, and other people there for So I think there already is some coordination, but it doesn't mean it can't there be is, better. There is, but it can always be yeah. better, right? I, and I'm certainly open to making it better. We certainly want to make sure we're all on the same page. So my second thing is, and this is a big concern I'm hearing out on the trail, uh, campaign trail, is that um, our school infrastructure is aging. Um, I mean, we, in the 1990s, we, were, we built like 10 or 12 schools in like 10 or 12 years. And um, what seems to be happening is we are, have continued growth out in the east, and we have overpopulated schools, which the school system is culpable in, in that in many ways. But 
I'd like to say that we continue to prioritize new schools and renovating schools that are really desperate, and it kind of is kicking the can down the road on other school communities, like you know the Oakland Mills community, the Talbot Springs community. It, it seems as though, um, especially communities that are impacted by other societal problems, are getting kind of neglected, and that's going to get worse. Um, it's, and I think you know that the schools are only getting older. And so, what can we do? And I don't know that I have the answer, but I'd like to pick your brain. Maybe is going into the future. What can we do to explore? Or other funding options so that we can continue to let the county grow and have new schools, but make sure that our other communities that exist here aren't being neglected. You know, That's exactly what we have to do. And one was what uh, the, the, uh, Ms. Fisher brought up earlier, too, is just looking at the impact fees and, and what we are allowed to do and give us a little more flexibility. That's certainly one way we can do it. Because that certainly all goes to capital. That doesn't go to operating. It just mm -hmm. goes to capital. Uh, I think we have to look at the transfer tax. I know uh, that's something we have to at least consider. Uh, we're lower than most counties around us. Um, I think we also have to see if we can get some flexibility within the transfer tax. Um, there are areas that maybe the, the county could decide, well, we think it'd be better to spend some of the money on this area over here. I know Delegate Flanagan tried to get something with that this past session. So I think there are several areas in which we could at least have a little more say. Uh, I think that would be a good thing, but I think the impact fees, transfer tax are, are two ways to start. Well, I hope I get the opportunity to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Make sure you get close up because I don't want them okay. to yell at me. I'm Leslie Long. Yeah, and yes. Uh, they, they put us up a little bit. Just a little bit. So. Okay. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you, good to see good you, to see you too. I just want to make sure we can hear you. Um, I thank you for your efforts mm -hmm. with the bad actor. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, too, like you, have lived in this county my entire life. I won't say how many years. A little closer to Okay. Yeah. I won't say how many years, but I've been here my entire life. Um, I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, how can you enforce Paul height when DB says, DPZ says it cannot to allow three acres at only five foot Paul height? How can you enforce day to day what is being exported off the farm for commercial sale as part of the 5% allowed for commercial sale or the 95% not allowed? Okay. Well, I know that there are are ways in which you can enforce height. There just are. I mean, other communities yeah. do it. There's got to be a way for us to do it. And I know that there's been talk about making sure, and I think maybe the council, Jen, correct me wrong, uh, passed legislation to have the fire department have more say, which allows things to happen more quickly on enforcement. So those things that we can do. So I think we can enforce the height. I think that's something we can do. How about the uh, percentage leaving, though, the 5%? Again. How do, how do you know it's actually 5% versus these guys can grind and ship out at night and you'll never know it. No, I understand that. I understand that and that we had to figure out ways which we're just trying to figure out ways we can make it so that it's less likely things will happen. One other thing is, and I don't want to say yet because I've talked to one council member about this, I know there's other amendments being considered to make a stronger enforcement, but I don't, it's not my amendment right now so I don't want to talk about it, but, but I think there are other things you'll see that ways in which we can try to be better, stronger, do better with our enforcement. Uh, because right now the farmers don't seem to really be having any problem with composting. They've been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't seen anybody use these large uh, right. piles of compost and right. mulch. Um, so I think if it's on the farm, by the farm, for the farm, that takes care of the whole problem. I understand that. I understand that. The only issue with composting is there is a requirement for them to get it, take it off if they're not using it after a year. And it'd be nice if we could figure out a way that they don't just lose that because that's the effort too they put in. Right. But it doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't need big trucks. But Right. Yeah. It's, if mm -hmm. they don't bring as much in, they can always right. bring in more as they need it. Right. I just so. thank you. For, thanks for sharing this You're long. Welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Judy Fisher-George. How are you? Good. Let's break down, yeah. Would not be a town meeting if I did not say a couple words. It would not. <laughs> and I would be so depressed. Okay. Go ahead. So um, as I'm leaving, and I've been a resident of Howard County for the last 22 years, and I just have to say, moving forward, I really hope you don't give short shrift to North Laurel Community Center Pool because we deserve it. Okay. And I want you to put more money aside so that it's not just a maybe something. Like, I want it to be a reality. I mean, it was pretty up upsetting that my daughter was like, I'm never gonna get to use this pool, but I want my friends to use it. It, it needs to be a reality for the people on the eastern side of the county. I also hope that you will do more than just what we've heard for so many years about Route 1. Mm -hmm. We would definitely like to see something more than yet another task force or mm -hmm. another committee to look at it. It's, mm -hmm. it's been looked at to death. Just do something. I really want Thank just you. somebody to do something. 
So when I come back, I'll be like, oh my gosh, that's it's the beautiful. coolest thing ever. Yes. That's what I want. So, um, and so disappointed in you for the bike path. Really did not want that bike path. No, you didn't. It could be somewhere else where people do want it. And you insist on putting something and money where people don't want it. And there are other parts of the county that are desperately screaming for that money. So I'm just incredibly disappointed in that part. And no, I wish you would stop giving our money away in TIFs to projects that the developer would pay for it anyway. We don't have to give money away in Howard County to have a developer develop. Okay. I, I appreciate it. And I, I just want to tell you about the pool. There's no question in my commitment to that pool. I think John Bird will tell you, we've worked very hard with the community to make sure that pool is going forward. And we put five more million dollars in this capital budget to make sure it's going forward. So it's going forward. It's going forward. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Hello, Mr. Loveless. How are you? Uh, fine. Good. Uh, a few years ago, B.B. Faustin called me up about a project in our neighborhood and drew me into a controversial topic with FBI land swaps, MIHUs, and all that. Beechcrest property. Oh, yeah, okay. To which we're still working to uh, come to a resolution. In that time frame, I was asked to join a task force for mulching as well as APFO. The mulching one, I was working very hard for the community. I felt like I was being handled, quite honestly. I'm an engineer, and the initial effort um, did not recognize what was going on with zero waste, M1, and all the intended effects for large swaps of Howard County. And only after years and years of effort have more reasonable measures come about, and we still have a long way to go with these. While on the APFO task force, you know, as well as me, that I proposed a very unpopular position, the impact fees you just talked about, schools tests, things of that nature, which brought the ire of the development community. I felt like I was being handled there too, and I was. One of the task force members destroyed our family home, left my aunt homeless, destroyed all our belongings, took all our money, and all that equipment is circling our house today, even minutes before I came up here. We've brought this up before. Mm -hmm. You talk about what people can do by right, by law, what their property rights were. My aunt, this is the black spot of this administration in Howard County, was systematically removed from her home with no compensation, no notice. We have yet to get our family's body back during this. It was meant to intimidate us. It was meant to force us. It was meant to make an example out of us. And I'm here to make an example that when this occurs, our community is going to stand up and ask that you take responsibility as well as all others to correct this measure. My aunt deserves to come back to her home, to her land, to her property, to her family. And right now, we're being drugged through courts intentionally to bankrupt our family during this. Mm -hmm. Our Department of License and Permits allowed the demolition of our fam family property. Our historic committee looked the other way. We granted waivers. We have looked, we have not, every single violation of code that I have brought up hasn't been investigated. Some people in this room were with me when I last filed that in September. How are you going to rectify this situation so that I can continue to advocate for our children and our historic locations and our environment and our family in Howard County, or are we not welcome here anymore? No, you're definitely welcome. You've been here for a long time. Um, and as you know, uh, this is a dispute between two private people. And the county is involved, but when there's two private people involved, the county can't get involved in that dispute. And that's my understanding of where things are. Now when things need to be done with the inspection and license and permit, it was my understanding that there was nothing, they had a legal right to do what they're doing, and inspections can't just say no. And it's, it was a, it's a dispute between two private people, entities, or whatever. So Brett, we can't say, we can't intervene in that, we're not, that's not a governmental uh, uh, obligation, or not obligation, even uh, jurisdiction. And so, 
I will always, if there's something you bring forward that has to be reviewed, I will make sure we do that. But if the court doesn't say you should, can do this, we're not going to be able to do this. And that's, I know that's something that's probably not what you want to hear, but I got to be honest. I mean, that's, you know, if, if, if there's no court order that says they can't do it, we can't just say you can't do it. If there's no reason in law that we say, you know what I mean? I can't just say because I'm Alan Kittleman, you can't do that. We have to have a reason in law why we're telling them that. Many departments have not stepped up and done their responsibility, and you have taken a great deal of con contributions from the person okay. who has done that over the years. Okay. I'm not reassured at the moment. Okay, I understand what you're saying. I, I appreciate that, but I'm just telling you, I can make sure that our, our departments follow the rules and the regulations, but if it's an impact between two private entities, we can't get involved in that dispute. Enforcement is a key concern, as yeah. is for all the mulching community, mm -hmm. whether it's our property mm -hmm. or that. I agree. And there are issues that aren't being enforced. Okay. That needs Thank to you. be ramped up. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. Good seeing you again, Brent. Yes, yeah. Hello. How uh, are you? Still not late, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I really uh, share the same concern with many people about the industry mulching mm -hmm. in the residential area. I mm -hmm. feel there's a tendency, we got more and more industrial development in residential mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. starting from Donaldson Funeral Home. I hope that trend can stop some way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of, unfortunately, more and more development going forward and without a great plan. I feel there are a lot of like, small development in Western Howard County, and uh, it's not well planned. I hope in the future that can mm -hmm. be planned a little better. Mm -hmm. I also want to know what's the school impact for the mulching industry. So is there any impact on school system? And uh, I, I want to know that as well for their evaluation in the future. Okay. And uh, second, uh, that's one comment. I have a question for you. And uh, I really appreciate your continuous support to the school system mm -hmm. for the last several years. However, during the last years about the high school 13, it's like the drama to really figure out what, where the high school 13 being located, right? And we are continuing to look about high school 14, elementary school in Turf Valley, and the renovation for other like old schools. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's your plan going forward with a constrained budget? What's your priority going forward? For and uh, for example, high school in Elk Ridge and uh, elementary school in sure. Turf Valley. Sure, sure, sure. And with regard to mulching real quick, one of the amendments I put in, and it was again a suggestion from Mr. Mariani, was to have a thousand foot setback from the school building. There was already in there a 500 setback from a school property, and I put in a thousand from the building. That was one thing. Um, no, I'm, I'm certainly committed to, to, to going forward with the 13th high school as fast as we can. Um, with regard to Elkridge, I have put together a group that can, of, of Elkridge advocates and Elkridge mm -hmm. folks to figure out the best place to put the 14th high school so we don't wait to make that decision when the time comes to build one. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate, I know that, I think they're starting to meet next week as the first meeting. Yeah, mm -hmm. And so that group is getting together. Uh, I'm fully committed to preserving Troy Park. No questions asked there. Mm -hmm. But I think now that we do have some time, we should look at other areas to make sure that's the best place to put it. Uh, so, so that's where I'm on that. And then, of course, of course at Turf Valley, we're, uh, we're, we're negotiating that to make sure that that elementary school is available because of the overcrowding in Manor Woods and some of the other elementary schools, even St. John's Lane and some others. And so that's where we are there. So um, I'm going to continue to work with the school system and you know, work on ways in which we can make sure the infrastructure is there in place. Uh, and those are the first few that I can, and also Hammond High School, too, moving that mm -hmm. forward, too. Okay, great. Okay, thank I, you. I wish I had the opportunity to work with you on this. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. How are, how are you? Thanks for coming out. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just want to. I kind of had to. Okay. <laughs> oh, well. Mm -hmm. I'll keep it brief. Thank you for requesting to withdraw CB21. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. I think that's the right move. Um, if it goes, you know, if we have a zoning rewrite, just remember that the health and safety concerns remain the same. Right. And um, as we look to the state for directions from them and as we develop our own um, directions, remember that the missing component here is that there weren't enough health experts involved. And there are also um, industry best practices that weren't included as well. Other states right. have gone through this. Other countries have gone through this. We don't have to make this up as we go along. Mm -hmm. 
But I'll tell you the number one issue that I hear from the farmers is they're worried about using their equipment on the roads. And so whatever we can do as a county to help them transport their equipment easily, efficiently, would go a long way to helping them be better, more effective farmers. I'm worried about that Tri-Delphia bridge closure. I'll send you an email about it because it's getting late. They need 17 foot of clearance and there's only going to be 12 feet when they close the lane. So expect an email from me. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I will tell you about the farm. I mean, that's part of living in the West. And I live out there too. And just the other day, I, was, I was, had to be somewhere and I got on Pfeffercorn Road and got behind a combine. Right. But you know what? That's part of living in the West. And they were going slow and that's fine. That's okay. I mean, that's part of living out there. It's, I think it's probably part of the joy of living out there. And so, uh, you know, we just have to make sure that the farmers are able to move their property. Yeah. And we have to make sure that people realize that they have a right to do that too. So that's yeah. one of the great, the bright side of this mulching debate is that the residents who didn't know very much about farming and the issues that they face understand a lot more and will continue that debate as a community. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. that's why we have the Farm Academy and so folks can be part of that too. And I forgot to talk, Ms. Fisher, Karina, I'm glad that you're part of Plan Howard Academy too. And that's, I think that's the second class coming through. And hopefully you found it beneficial. Everyone I've talked to has really found it as something that even folks who have been involved find it beneficial. So, Mr. Horwitz. Good evening. How are um, you? Go back to uh, Erickson and the milk uh, development. The milk producers? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have to disagree with my HCCA friends who were opposing the PSA extension because I thought the overall putting a Plan uh, retirement care. Oh, you're talking about Erickson. I'm sorry, I've misheard it. Okay, okay. I'm getting the both. Okay. Um, outweighed it, whatever other development of houses or what I could end up or okay. uh, commercial could go there. And in making the presentation, Mr. Erskine for the developer talked about how the aging community and how the statistics they said that they're not even really making a dent in the needs of the future for elderly facilities in the county. And he said how it's very impossible to find 50 acres to build a continuing care retirement facility because most of the land's taken up. Meanwhile, his other client is the milk producers mm -hmm. who has acres in addition to the 121 that's being proposed for the 50, year, 50 acre retirement care facilities. Um, so there's plenty of room, it's just that client apparently wants to build different type of development. Now, I've tried to talk to Mr. Lasden's about the, the uh, school test, because I find the whole thing a farce, because eventually everything's gonna pass, and it's based on what I feel is a fallacy of interpretation of the takings law, because to be a taking, you have to be deprived of substantially all economic use of the property. And if you're allowed to build a continuing care retirement facility, or even some of the things that are already allowed under the code, apparently uh, you could build commercial or a convent or religious facility in, in a lot of the R facilities, there's, there's actually no taking. And seeing how the Supreme Court might in the years ahead, and, or the courts work through the Supreme Court's decision in Muir versus Wisconsin, which changed the way a parcel was calculated, and whether or not you could consider the entire farm as one parcel, therefore they already have a farm, so they've already gotten a development, whether they're entitled to piece off the things. So that's an answered question of how that case will be interpreted. But it seems if there's a need for retirement facilities and the community doesn't want an impact in the schools there, how do we get the code to get these facilities built before the last large parcels are all sucked up um, and then 20 years from now ago we'll still have a, uh, a lack of retirement facilities in the county and the schools are still going to be overcrowded hmm. um, and in part of the process is this four-year school test for some of these larger parcels it seems you should fail forever to get a different development rather than a traditional single-family town home or houses so mm -hmm. okay uh, i appreciate i was going to say i mean the response to that is that the general response to that is if uh now it's five years so if they go five years plus three years so it's eight years before developing a build 
The response is that gives the county and the school system time to make changes, to make it work. And uh, I understand your, your point about the takings. I think there's probably disagreement on that. But, um, but that's kind of what the, what the rationale is, that eight years should be plenty of time for the county and the school system to figure out how to make it work. That's what I'm saying. I think that's what the argument is. Well, it's the argument, but in the meantime, it's just I find it ironic Mr. Erskine's got two clients. Yeah. He's arguing for one, there's not enough land available, so we need to re redo the PSA, don't, don't but in the second one, we, we need to... to... We have yeah. to get out of here. Yeah. You represent your client. I'm a lawyer. You've got to represent your client. Yep. Okay. Only these people here. Okay. I, I, I assume that was true. Be, you have to be quick. I assume that was true. The, the, the staff is letting us stay here. They're working overtime. Because they like stew. Okay. It's you, yeah. Alan. Yeah, right. Okay. Hi. I'm Hi. Jen Mallow. And I'm one of the candidates here running for Board of Education. And I appreciate that you have found an additional, I think, half million dollars. Well, I haven't found it. I've asked them to look for it. But yeah, okay. we'll find it. But, yeah. but we're, we're looking for it. Yeah. However, I do want to point out that that is just a subset of the Title I schools that will be affected. There are currently 12 Title I schools, and that is not sufficient funding for those. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't include funding for middle schools or high schools, and that's the same vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. So if we are looking at differentiated money f to fund those programs and not, re not have greater class sizes in those schools, then we need to take into account, or I'd ask you to take into account, that there are no middle schools or high schools considered Title I in Howard County. Right. Additionally, um, what this also brings us to is if we are looking for money to offset this issue of rising class size. Um, I want to link it to our problems of overcrowding. And last year you came out and said, and strongly encouraged the school system not to redistrict at a high school level. Mm -hmm. Yet we found that Jumpstart isn't getting the turnover out of those overcrowded schools. And so I'm asking, will you commit to publicly speaking in favor of redistricting to support whatever the Board of Education determines to be in the best interest. If the Board of Education redistricts, that's what they'll do. They're a separate elected body, and I, I respect their decision. Just the same way I did about 13th High School. I would be happy to put it in Troy Park or at Mission Road. They chose Mission Road. I respect their decision. If you get on the board, I will respect your decision because you'll be elected by the citizens of Howard County. And so it's not like if they say they're going to redistrict, it's not like I can say you can't. Oh, I know. But what I'm asking is, will you commit ahead of time to say supporting the notion that we knew, need redistricting because the schools are overcrowded and unsafe at the point of overcrowding in some of them? Got to wait and see what they, what they suggest. Why would I say yes to something I don't know what it is yet? Because you know the problem exists. But no, no, there could be a problem, but that doesn't mean their solution is the right solution. That's what I'm saying. So let's see what their solution is. So thank you very much. And also, just so everyone remembers, uh, the, the, the money I put in the operating budget for the school system is the exact amount that the superintendent requested. It's not the $50 million more that the school board wanted for the health fund. And that's the one thing we haven't discussed when we talk about education folks. That is the elephant in the room. We have a $50 million deficit, and it was the school system that made decisions on where they wanted to place money and maybe re remove some money. It wasn't me saying they had to cut that. That's what their decision was to cut that. We put the money in that the superintendent had requested, and that's how they decided to do it. Thanks. Yes. Hi, Mr. Kittleman. Hey. Uh, Seth Raymond running for Board of Education, but I'm going to wear my uh, business hat today. Good. Um, so as a company, uh, we are in federal agencies and a lot of different states. Every single jurisdiction we go to, county or city, they have local small business programs, including state of Maryland. All the neighboring counties have local small business programs. Howard County is not one of them. Why would we not have a local small business program to reinvest within the community? I'm talking about a pref preference program that provides preference to local small Howard County based businesses when they're competing with small businesses from other jurisdictions or other states or other. Okay, well we do have a program to. Not local small business program, we given have the Howard County businesses preference. Okay, we do have a program in Howard County, if there's a procurement, because that's what we can control, if there's a procurement and you are a certified local business, you get preference in Howard County for Howard County procurement. We have that. So I checked with the, the mm -hmm. procurement folks mm -hmm. We do not have a preference program. We do have a small business program, okay. but we don't have a preference to small businesses that are 
Howard County based small businesses. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll have to find out because yeah. I'm not detect I mean, maybe there's some misinformation there, but we put that together purposely to help small business or businesses, not even small business, businesses be certified that are located in Howard County and they would get a preference. So I could, I'll look more into that, but I okay. appreciate that. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Knoppinger, I think you are going to be closing out the night. Yes, sir. <laughs> good good evening. You. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Goos. I love. Yeah. Yes, they're not doing well. They're not doing well. But that's ups and downs. Let's look. Yeah, get a little closer. They said they can't yes. hear you. I need to. Pull, I need to. Yeah, yeah, oh, right. Excuse yeah. me. I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. No problem. I need to point out the flag to you. Do you realize that flag was over there, and that's. And people do not even know protocol for that. Okay. We're talking about education. We have children that, if they do not have access to this and a computer, mm -hmm. they're not learning, supposedly. Now, we hear they have too little time to sleep while they're up until 12 o'clock at night, doing whatever on these. And then they expect to get up at 6 o'clock and go and be bright eyed and push your tail. Keep close, keep close, yeah. So, what I'm trying to say to you is, as we speak here tonight in this meeting, which it's really dwindling down, <laughs> Keep looking, yeah. what's happening is someone's already invented something else we're going to have to learn to do. So where do you have the wherewithal to give all this money to education when you have too many people coming into the county to find more homes, to, to inundate the roadways, it's for tax relief. That's what we need those people for. But what I'm trying to get at is, I paid for my car. I paid $135 per car to drive it. I paid $35 for myself and the wife, each of us, to be on the road. Now, that's a privilege. That's not a given. We have people now with their cell phones they are stopping at the red lights. And they are thinking that in a 30 second light, they can get a text message off. And they're holding traffic up. Now we also have people that come to the end of their particular development, and they sit there, and they're adjusting their GPS. And you have to go around them. People are very ignorant and rude today. They have no respect for the other person. We need to teach our children that respect. We wouldn't have so many killings because they're not thinking that the other guy is equal to me. And as far as people having rights, the gentleman over there said they have a right to do something. Because you have a right doesn't mean you have to do it. And if you signed on for something, you signed on for it. That's your word. That should be your bond. And I'm so glad I won when you and I were running for election, if you get what I'm saying. Gotcha. You went down to Annapolis. You've done a wonderful job. I appreciate everything you've done for this county. Thanks. And I want you to stay the course. Okay. Thank you. you. You are a gift to this county, and the people do not know it. Okay. Most people. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thank you very much, Bernie. I appreciate it. Thank you so All much. You. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Bernie. Let me just, let's just close out, and I just want to thank you. I want to thank Stu Cohn for always inviting me to come to the annual meeting, and thank you for being willing to maybe move it out of Hawthorne so that we could have a little bigger area, because I know that was an issue for the last couple of years, that there was enough room for everybody to be in there. So thank you for... Well, thank you for working with me on that. Thank you all for coming. And the last thing I would say is you should ask all your elected officials to do what I do. Every elected official should stand in front of the audience for an hour and a half or two hours and answer questions. Um, you don't see that very often, folks. Just letting you know that you don't see that very often. I think every local elected official should stand in front of you and answer questions. Thank you very much.